the World Cup is always known to have a great underdog story in each edition, like Morocco reaching the semifinals at the 2022 World Cup, Croatia unexpectedly making the final at the 2018 World Cup, and even Ghana almost making it to the semifinals at the 2010 World Cup. But many football fans tend to forget Costa Rica's surprising run at the 2014 World Cup, with them almost making the semifinals despite being put in an extremely difficult group. So how exactly did Costa Rica prove everybody wrong and shock the world at the tournament? Well, why don't we take a look? In order to play at the World Cup, you need to qualify for it first, which is exactly what Los Ticos had to do. Luckily for Costa Rica though, with the country being amongst the top 6 CONCACAF nations in the FIFA rankings, they got to skip the first and second round of World Cup qualifying and went straight into the third round. The third round of CONCACAF World Cup qualifying consisted of 3 groups of 4, with each group containing 1 pot 1 nation, aka the top 3 countries in the region, 1 pot 2 nation, the 4 to 6th place best nations, and 2 teams from pot 3, which were the remaining countries that made it through from the second round of qualifying. When the draw was said and done, Costa Rica ended up getting drawn with CONCACAF Giants Mexico, El Salvador, and Guyana. And this was somewhat of a difficult group for them. The first team Costa Rica had to play in the qualifiers was El Salvador, arguably the best national team in pot 3. But in the first game, Costa Rica had a dream start, with Alvaro Saborio scoring at the start of the game in the 10th minute, and Costa Rica star boy at the time, Joel Campo, scoring 5 minutes later to make it 2-0 for Los Ticos. However, El Salvador were fight back and Gutierrez scored in the 23rd minute for them, and Romero ended up bagging the second goal for the Salvadorians in the 53rd minute, meaning that the game ended 2-2 despite Costa Rica being up by two goals. But Costa Rica would end this June international window strongly, with them battering Guyana away from home. Thanks to a singular goal by Jean Campo and a hat-trick by Alvaro Sabario, Costa Rica ended up taking three points in their 4-0 win against the Guyanese. Things were looking up for Costa Rica, but they still had to play the group favorites Mexico, which they had to do twice in the September international window that was next. And these two games didn't end up going well for Costa Rica. The first game against Mexico at home home left the 30,000 plus Costa Rica fans at the stadium disappointed, with the country getting dominated by the CONCACAF Giants and this ended up with Los Ticos losing 2-0. Four days later, Costa Rica had to play Mexico again, except this time away from home and at the Estadio Azteca, one of the most legendary football stadiums in the world, with the likes of Pele and Maradona lifting World Cups at that ground. Unlike those two though, Costa Rica couldn't make history, and despite putting up a decent performance in the first half, Chicharito got the breakthrough for Mexico and this gave them the 1-0 win over the Costa Ricans. So after four games, it wasn't looking good at all for Los Ticos, with the country only managing to gather 4 points in their first 4 games of qualifying. Luckily for them though, El Salvador surprisingly dropped points to Guyana at home 2-2, which meant that Costa Rica still had a decent shout in making it to the 4th round of qualifying, as long as they beat El Salvador in their next game and hope that El Salvador also loses it to Mexico. And Costa Rica would do just that in the last international window of the 3rd round qualifiers. In the October window, Costa Rica went away to El Salvador, with Los Ticos actually being the underdogs in that game since they were 1 point behind the Salvadorian. Regardless of that though, Costa Rica were putting up a great fight and the breakthrough eventually happened in the 31st minute thanks to a great strike from Jose Cubero and this lone goal helped Costa Rica defeat El Salvador away from home 1-0 which put the qualification back in Costa Rica's hands and Costa Rica would not fumble this opportunity because in the last third round qualifying game against Guyana, Costa Rica cooked them alive with 5 different players from the national team scoring in that game to eventually defeat the Guyanese 7-0 and then with El Salvador unsurprisingly losing to Mexico away from home 2-0, this meant that Costa Rica come comfortably finished second place in their group, which meant that they were going to the fourth round of CONCACAF World Cup qualifying, also more famously known as the HEX. The HEX is the final round of qualifying, and it consists of one single group with the three group winners and three second place finishers. And by the end of the HEX, the top three spots will automatically qualify for the World Cup, while fourth place will go into the FIFA Inter-Confederation playoffs. Now this campaign's HEX was definitely going to be difficult for Costa Rica, with the likes of the two CONCACAF giants, USA and Mexico, obviously being present, and Honduras and Jamaica also making it through. Which which is a problem for Costa Rica considering that both of those nations were placed higher than them in the official FIFA rankings. And then there was also Panama, who had a ton of young talented players to be wary of. So yeah, it wasn't initially looking good for Costa Rica. They would need to pull off some miracle results if they wanted to qualify for the World Cup. And as you all probably already know, that's exactly what Los Ticos did. Costa Rica's first game of the Hex was away to Panama, and it didn't start off too great. In the 15th minute, Panama's Luis Enriquez scored the opening goal to give his country the lead. And 12 minutes later, one of Panama's best players, Roman Torres, got on the board within the 6 yard box and got his country their second goal of the match. However, Costa Rica didn't let this 2 goal lead phase them and in the 39th minute, right before half time, their main goal scoring threat, Alvaro Sabario, brought one back for his country. Then, very late into the game in the 84th minute, one of Costa Rica's best players, Brian Ruiz, scored a great bicycle kick to equalize for his country and the game ended 2-2. All things considered, even though Costa Rica didn't get the win, managing to get 1 point from 2 goals down is a pretty decent result. The next game for Costa Rica was going to be way more difficult though, with them going away 
away to play one of the best countries in the region, the United States. It wasn't just any normal game though, but the game was scheduled by US Soccer to be in Colorado in March, while it was snowing pretty hard. And now years later, this game is famously known as Snow Classico, since, well, I don't think I really have to explain why it's called that. Just use your eyes, bro. The US Federation thought that playing in a cold environment would benefit the USMNT, since Costa Rica isn't used to playing in cold temperatures, since their country is known for being tropical and hot, obviously. And I mean, I guess it worked, because at the end of the day, the US were the ones who got the three points, with Dempsey scoring the lone goal for the US in the 16th minute, and this helped the United States defeat Costa Rica 1-0. You would think that the US would learn from this game and maybe not do this ever again, considering how terrible the playing conditions were. But judging from the 2022 World Cup qualifying campaign, yeah, I don't think they've learned at all. Anyways, Costa Rica's national team was not happy about the conditions they had to play in, with the coach of the team, Jorge Pinto, saying that this match was an embarrassment to football, and said that the referee should be suspended for allowing the game to play. Additionally, the Costa Rican Football Federation submitted a formal complaint to FIFA, stating that the physical integrity of the players was neglected, the stadium personnel invaded the pitch during the match, the snow covered the pitch lines, and the ball could not roll properly due to the snow. But FIFA dismissed this complaint. Boy, ain't no way, boy. Boy, ain't no way, boy. The Costa Rican fans were outraged so much that in their next game at home against Jamaica, the Costa Rican fans in attendance turned their backs when FIFA's fair play flag was displayed and were even heard chanting Hijo de Puta, which translates to son of a bitch, during the fair play anthem. The Costa Rican players were completely focused on the task at hand though, and thanks to goals from Amunia in the 22nd minute and Calvo in the 82nd minute, Costa Rica got their first win in the hex by beating Jamaica 2-0 at home. And now, Costa Rica has gotten a total of 4 points in their first 3 matches. Not bad, but the next international window was gonna be difficult with them having to play Honduras at home first, then Mexico away, which they've already lost at in the third round of qualifying, and Panama at home. But Costa Rica got that dog in them, and they were ready to cook in this three-game international window. First against Honduras at home, a country that has ranked above Los Ticos and qualified for the 2010 World Cup, Costa Rica pulled up with a great shock and beat the Hondurans 1-0, thanks to an untidy finish by Roy Miller in the 25th minute. The next games would be one of Costa Rica's biggest challenges though, and that's playing against Mexico away at the Azteca once again. They've already lost to them in the previous round, like I've said. So going there now, Costa Rica were even bigger underdogs, but the game kind of went like this. And thanks to Costa Rica pulling a Diego Simeone or a Jose Mourinho, meaning that they parked the bus, this helped them earn a point in a nil-nil draw. It's a bit shameless from Costa Rica, but listen, you gotta do what you gotta do sometimes. Respect, 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 man, respect. Then in the last match of the window, Costa Rica beat Panama 2-0 as a result of two goals from Brian Ruiz in the 49th minute and Celso Borges in the 52nd minute. These three points put Costa Rica in a great position to qualify, with them currently being second place in the hex at the time, being ahead of Mexico in fact. Moving on to the next inter international window, Costa Rica had the opportunity to get revenge on their ops in the hex, the United States, with them hosting the Americans at home this time. Costa Rica had revenge on their mind, for not only the Snow Classico, but also the fact that the United States manager, Jurgen Klinsmann, came out and said that the US would have beat Costa Rica by even more if the snow hadn't been there, and Costa Rica took that insult personally. In fact, they had USA defeated for a minute too, due to a goal from Acosta that gave Los Ticos an early lead. Seven minutes later in the ninth minute, Borges got the second for his country, and even though Dempsey kept the game alive by scoring a penalty in the 43rd minute, Joel Campo finished the game off in the 75th minute and got Costa Rica a 3-1 victory. This gave Costa Rica the opportunity to seal qualification to the World Cup in the next game for the first time in 8 years. Sadly for them though, they somehow drew 1-1 to Jamaica, with Anderson halting the party in the 90 plus second minute to equalize the game for the Jamaicans. But actually, even though Costa Rica didn't get the win, they actually still qualified for the tournament, with Mexico losing to USA 2-0, one of the many famous Dos Aceros, and Honduras drawing to Panama 2-2. These results helped Costa Rica gain an automatic spot to the World Cup in Brazil. And they did this with two games to spare. Impressive. And even though the next two games for Costa Rica didn't even matter, I feel like it's important to at least go over them. So in the following match against Honduras away from home, Costa Rica lost 1-0. But at home against Mexico, they pulled off a surprising victory against the Mexicans, beating them 2-1 thanks to a 63rd minute goal from Saborio. And this result helped Costa Rica secure second place in the Hex, and also played a part in pushing Mexico down to fourth place, where they were sent to the Inter-Confederation playoffs. Now qualifiers aren't the only preparation games for countries going to the World Cup, as most of you probably already know. And this is because most national teams play in friendlies against teams from other regions, which is exactly what Costa Rica did. But to say it didn't go well for Costa Rica would be an understatement. In Costa Rica's first game of 
preparation against Australia, they lost 1-0. Then they got spanked by Chile 4-0, lost to South Korea 1-0, beat Paraguay 2-1, that's a good result, but that didn't last long because they lost to Japan after 3-1 and drew to the Republic of Ireland 1-1. To make matters worse, Costa Rica were drawn into one of the most difficult groups at the tournament, with them being in a group with the one-time World Cup winner, England, who were 11th place on the FIFA rankings and had some crazy good players like Raheem Sterling, Daniel Sturridge, Frank Lampard, Wayne Rooney, Steven Gerrard, etc. Then there was also Italy, the four-time World Cup champions, and were also 9th place in the FIFA rankings, with players like Pirlo, Bonucci, Chiellini, Buffon, Verratti, Balotelli, etc. And then there was Uruguay, the two-time World Cup champions, and also 6th place on the FIFA rankings, with players such as Edison Cavani, Diego Forlan, Diego Godin, and one of the greatest strikers ever, Luis Suarez, with him that season bagging 31 goals for Liverpool, setting a Premier League record for most goals in the season at the time. So safe to say, it was not looking too good for Costa Rica. It's not looking good, bruv. It's not looking good. But Costa Rica has some firepower of their own. They had Brian Ruiz, their number 10 and key player, who also played for the likes of Fulham and PSV Eindhoven at the time. Joel Campa was also there, Costa Rica star boy who played with the likes of Real Betis, Olympiacos, and of course Arsenal. And then there was Keylor Navas, who was playing for Levante at the time, but would go on to be one of the best goalkeepers not only in Real Madrid's history, with him winning three Champions Leagues with the club in the future, but one of the best goalkeepers in history, period. Costa Rica also had some other good players as well, like Oscar Duarte, Christian Bolaños, Junior Diaz, Marco Reina, etc. Now, it's easy to look in hindsight though and say that Costa Rica had a decent fighting chance, but at the time, all football fans, including myself, were sleeping on the country and thought that they were definitely finishing bottom of the group. But oh boy, were we wrong. Real quick before we get on with that though, please remember to subscribe to the channel. We're close to 100,000 subscribers and I would just really appreciate it, so thank you. And also, if you guys can, follow my Twitter and my Instagram, both at Nabuto, if you just want to hear my thoughts on football games, transfers, and overall, just to get to know me more. So if you want to, feel free to hit me up with that follow. Follow. Thank you. Back to topic, Costa Rica started their World Cup campaign against Uruguay, the highest ranked nation in the group according to FIFA. The Costa Rican manager, Pinto, went with a 4-5-1 formation to combat Uruguay's 4-4-2 formation, making sure that there wasn't any open space for Uruguay to counterattack, while the wingbacks for Costa Rica went and joined up on the attack to help out the likes of Campbell up top and Brian Ruiz at the 10. And these two were deadly in the game. But it didn't start off hot for Costa Rica, with them giving up a penalty at around the 24th minute, in which Cavani easily slotted it in to give the Uruguayans the lead. Now the first half between between these two sides was a good battle. And even though Uruguay got the better chances, Costa Rica kept themselves in the game. And this paid off in the second half. Because in the 54th minute, Joel Campo blasted volley into the net to surprisingly bring back the game to a 1-1 stalemate. But this draw would only last for three more minutes. Because thanks to Duarte's header in the 57th minute and a Bolaños free kick, Costa Rica got a 2-1 lead against powerhouses Uruguay unexpectedly. And then in the 84th minute, Costa Rica sealed the game off thanks to Ureña slipping the ball past Muslera. And this final goal ended up giving Costa Rica a 3-1 victory. And also helped them end up on top of the table, with Italy having a plus one goal difference only at the time after beating England 2-1. Now even though Costa Rica pulled off this miracle win, football fans weren't convinced that Costa Rica could continue to win games in the group. Not gonna lie, I remember thinking that as well, because I'm a Liverpool fan, if you couldn't tell. And I remember thinking that if Luis Suarez played in that game, which he didn't since he was recovering from an injury, Uruguay could have easily won. Basically I and many other football fans thought that this was a lucky victory from Costa Rica. But yet again, Costa Rica proved everybody wrong and shocked the world. World. Moving on, the second match against Italy was set up as a spicy affair due to both teams winning their first game, meaning that whoever won this game would get 6 points and a guaranteed spot in the knockout rounds. And the winner was the team that nobody thought could do it, Costa Rica. In the 44th minute, Costa Rica's captain and key player, Brian Ruiz, gets his head on the ball and scored the lone goal of the match, meaning that Costa Rica ended up defeating Italy, guaranteeing a spot in the knockout rounds to everybody's surprise. Not only that, Costa Rica did this by beating powerhouses Uruguay and Italy. And as expected, the Costa Rican players were shocked and excited that they managed to pull off this miracle, and so were their fans, with the fans in Brazil and back home celebrating this joyous occasion. But the job wasn't finished. There was still one more game left in the group stages. Job's not finished. Job finished? I don't think so. Okay, to be honest, it was kind of finished because Costa Rica already made it through and England were already out since they ended up losing to Uruguay 2-1 in the second game through a Luis Suarez masterclass. But still, this game was kind of important for Costa Rica because if they got a result against England, they would finish on top of the group. And that's what they did. They defended vigorously against the English and eventually this got them the nil-nil draw they were looking for, helping them finish on top of a group with Uruguay, Italy, and England, with England finishing dead last. Hey, y'all come look at this. 
I'm gonna repeat that last part though, just to truly reiterate how difficult this was. Costa Rica topped a group containing the likes of Uruguay, Italy, and England. Wow. Not gonna lie, even as a USA fan, I have to admit that this was definitely more impressive than the US getting out of their group of death, but we move. Anyways, Costa Rica finishing on top of the group had its benefits, since they avoided Colombia, who were in group C, and they were having a great tournament themselves, with them winning every single game in their group, and James Rodriguez was putting on a match class at the tournament. Instead, Costa Rica were given the task of playing Greece in the round of 16, who finished second place in their group and only managed to get four points, with them losing to Colombia 3-0 in the opening match, drawing Japan 0-0 in the second match, and beat Ivory Coast in the last minute 2-1, thanks to a penalty from Samaras in the third match. This basically means that Costa Rica were given a favorable matchup, despite it looking like an even game when you initially think of the country names. Anyways, the first half of Costa Rica versus Greece was an even affair, with not many chances happening for either team, but Keylor Navas did make one amazing save against the Greek to keep the match even. Then in the second half, Costa Rica's captain, Brian Ruiz, hits a perfectly accurate ball into the bottom right corner in the 52nd minute to give the Costa Ricans a 1-0 lead in the round 16. But sadly after this, Costa Rica were slowly losing their grip on the game. In the 66th minute, Oscar Duarte, who was already on a caution, took out Greece's number 20 in a slide tackle. And this gave the ref no other option but to book Oscar Duarte again and to send him off, leaving Costa Rica to play with 10 men. And then the hearts of the Costa Rican national team and their fans broke in the 90 plus first minute with Socrates Papastopolo 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 Papastopolos. Wow, this name is hard to pronounce. Uh, let me try again. Socrates P gets the ball off an initial save from Kaylor Navas and bags a last minute goal to equalize for the Greek and send the game to extra time against the 10 men Costa Rican side. And as expected, Greece dominated the chances in extra time as well. But Kaylor Navas was doing everything for his country not to go home and he was pulling off miracle saves one after the other. No cap, this game alone probably convinced Florentino Perez to sign this man to Real Madrid and the rest is history. Anyways, Keylor Navas helped Costa Rica hang on and got them to a penalty shootout. And in this penalty shootout, Costa Rica were flawless, scoring their first four penalties while Greece scored their first three. However, Gekas from Greece stepped up to the plate and Keylor Navas pulled up a clutch save to give Costa Rica a great opportunity to go through. And Michael Umania, the Costa Rican defender who had the responsibility of the fifth penalty, hits a top end, meaning that Costa Rica were through to the quarterfinals of the 2014 World Cup after beating Greece 5-3 on penalties. On to the quarterfinals, Costa Rica had the difficult task of facing the Netherlands, the team that made the final at the 2010 World Cup against Spain, in which they lost. But then they destroyed Spain in their opening game at the 2014 World Cup 5-1, and have been doing very well at the tournament following that. They may or may not have controversially beat Mexico in the round 16 though, with Ayn Robin potentially diving for a last minute penalty. But hey, the game's the game, I guess. In the game, the Netherlands had a ton of talented attacking players on the pitch, like Robin Van Persie, Ayn Robin, Memphis Depay, Wesley Snyder, and Jorginho Wijnaldum. So Pito had his Costa Rican team playing on the defensive, and it worked since this tactic got them all the way to the penalty shootout. I'm sure Croatia must have adapted this tactic at the 2018 World Cup as well, where they made the final through a few penalty shootouts. But you gotta do what you gotta do, you feel me? Sadly for Costa Rica though, despite having penalty shootout experience at the tournament already, this time it didn't end up too well for them. Especially because Louis Van Hall, the Netherlands manager, subbed out their main goalkeeper, Selsen, for a penalty goalkeeping expert, Tim Krul. And this worked like a charm for the Dutch. Eventually, Tim Krul was responsible for saving an excellent bottom corner penalty from Brian Ruiz, and eventually ended up saving the fifth penalty kick from Amania, the same player who hit a top bins against Greece earlier. And thanks to this Tim Krul masterclass, the Netherlands were the ones moving on to the semifinals, while Costa Rica were sent out of the competition in heartbreaking fashion. However, despite Costa Rica going out cruelly, see what I did there, cruelly, Tim Krul, huh, huh? Okay, never mind. I'm sorry, that was a bit cringe. <laughs> Like I was saying, despite Costa Rica going out in the quarterfinals, the Costa Rican fans were proud of their national team for making history and going that far in the first place. And they should be, because this is one of the best underdog stories I've seen at the World Cup. And I feel like this story in particular isn't brought up enough. Also since then, Costa Rica's football has gotten a spark, and now has become a regular participant in World Cups, with them qualifying for the 2018 and 2022 edition. Sadly, they weren't able to recreate their achievements at the 2014 edition by making the knockout stages. But still, nobody will ever forget what Costa Rica accomplished all those years ago and they should be proud of themselves and I'm sure that they are. Anyways, if you guys enjoyed this video, please remember to subscribe. I would really appreciate it. And please be sure to follow my Twitter and my Instagram. The links are in my YouTube description. And last but not least, if you want to learn more about how Liverpool's Academy has gotten so good lately, you definitely want to check out this video right here. You won't regret it.